We are, we are continuing on, actually we're finishing our series on relationship status, relationship status. And this has been a fun series, hasn't it? I tell you, I have been just so excited about what God has done, and uh, it's, it's just amazing. It's just amazing to hear the stories of, of life change, the stories of how God is, is bringing couples uh, closer together, how God is restoring relationships, and I'm just pumped up about that. So we are talking about today how, how love grows, how love deepens, and there's a difference between intentions and actions, isn't there? Isn't it interesting how we tend to judge other people by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about that today because so often in a relationship series like this, as we go through the book of Song of Solomon, as we study this couple and, and see their relationship flourish and grow, so often we hear the principles of the word of God, we hear the message of the gospel preached, and so often we listen to the principles and we intend to do something, but oftentimes our actions they don't speak. Our actions, they go no further. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. I'm going to talk about how we can really bridge the gap between our intentions and our actions. Let me give you the context of where we are in this series called Relationship Status. We saw in the first week this couple come together. They were attracted to each other in several different ways. And then in chapter 2, we saw them go into a courtship. And for those of you who are single, I'd encourage you to read chapter two because courtship is really a more of a biblical principle than the whole dating scene that we have here today. And then in chapter three and four, it got really spicy and hot in here because we talked about sex, all right? And for those of you who are um, in here who went through that, God bless you. I didn't get too many emails and you're still here, so that's good. Um, Chapters 5 and 6, we talked about conflict in relationship and how to fight right. Because again, everybody fights in relationship. Everybody fights in marriage. It's a matter of fighting right. And we're not going to fight in our marriage. We're going to fight for our marriage. It's not about who gets on top, who's the winner of an argument, because you can be the winner of an argument and lose your spouse. Well, today, we're going to see the time in between the honeymoon and death. It's the relationship as it flourishes, as it grows. This is 10 years into marriage. This is 20 years into marriage. This is 30 years into marriage. And what we're going to see is that their relationship is still strong. It's still flourishing. It's still growing. It's exciting. And I'm going to give you three simple thoughts that I want you to focus on this morning. Three simple points that will help you in the context of your relationship. The first is this. If you think something good, we're going to say it. If you think something good, we're going to say it. Why is that important? Why is that such a big deal? It's because life and death are in the power of the tongue. If you want a life-giving marriage, speak life-giving words. You have the power in your mouth to speak life to your marriage. You have a power in your mouth to speak life to your relationship, to your spouse, but you also have the power to seep poison into your relationship, to tear it apart by the words that we speak. So chapter 7 starts off with him complimenting his wife's body. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but men... Women care a lot about what other people think about their body, all right? You should get my perspective from up here, all right? I'm, I'm looking up here, and I'm, I'm seeing all of these ladies, and you know what? You are dressed very nice. You are dressed exquisite, all right? Guys, you're different. It's hygienic for you, okay? <laughs> you don't care about looking nice oftentimes. This, does it fit? Is it halfway clean? I mean, I'll make sure that, that I can just find something to wear, button it up, snap it on, I'm going to church, everything is going to be fine. But women care about their bodies. They care about what other people think about them. So oftentimes, as a pastor, I can look up here and I can tell what season we are in based upon what the women are wearing. I can tell if you're going into spring, 
I can tell if it's getting around fall. I can tell when you're angry, when you've had a bad morning. Huh? Because you care about what you wear and you care so much about your bodies. And also, guys, have you ever noticed guys are very different when it comes to relationship with each other? We are friends with other guys based upon how we can offend them, right? It's true. If you talk to some guys, when they meet their buddies, they're intimate when they can make fun of each other in a real happy way. Why? Hey, fat boy, what's up, man? What's up, baldy? It's so good to see you. That's how guys connect. That's how you know, as brothers, man, we love each other. What's up, fat boy? Oh, you silly, stupid-looking fool. That's how guys are. That's just, and you can really tell if you love them, if you insult them and hit them too. What's up, man? And you hit them and you're, what's up, baldy? Yeah, you're my friend. But it's true, man. Guys, we insult each other, all right, to tell how much we love each other. It's not so with women, all right? It doesn't work with women. Like, you will not go outside in the parking lot as you're coming into church, and you will not hear another woman say to a woman, Hey, fat girl, what's up? <laughs> that, that does not happen, all right? They tend to get offended. They tend to get hurt. Now, I say all that to say this, that so oftentimes, guys, we don't realize how our words can damage how our words can hurt. See, oftentimes, us men, we can take our friendship relationship with each other and try to transition that to our spouse. And we can say hurtful words about her body, and you don't even mean to offend. You don't even mean to hurt, and yet we don't even realize how deep those daggers can go. And here we see in Song of Solomon, the seventh chapter, this man does everything he can to praise her. His praise reinforces her. He doesn't just think something good. He uses his words to encourage her to speak words of life about her body. Look at chapter seven. We're going to look through verses one through seven, but you're going to remember uh, chapter one. Remember chapter one, he starts from her head down. Here, he's going to get a little creative. He's going to start from her feet up. We're going to see these verses here, how he speaks words of life to encourage his spouse. This is what it says in verse one. How beautiful your sandaled feet, O prince's daughter. Your great, graceful legs are like jewels, the work of an artist's hands. Every time I read that verse, I think of the Christmas story movie. You remember when the kid got that leg lamp? You know, he just, oh. I mean, he just thinks that, ah, oh, this is just incredible. This is what this guy's doing. He's loving his spouse after years and years of marriage he still is speaking words of life. He's still encouraging his wife. He's still telling her how beautiful she is. Now, women, let me tell you something. If your man come to you and said, hey, your legs are still hot, they're still sexy, honey, you are still beautiful, what are you going to say? You lie. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. Let him encourage you. Don't, don't cut him down. Let him speak words of life to you. Let him encourage you. Let him tell you how much he loves you and how beautiful you are to him. Listen, if you put up the stop sign every time he encourages you, you're not going to get encouraged anymore. This man, after all of these years, still says you're beautiful. He says in verse 2, your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. Now listen to me. That guys, that'll kick you that'll get you kicked right out of bed if you if you don't explain it here, okay? I'd encourage all men never to say that their wife is a mound of anything, all right? That's important. That's important. See, we're we're coming in several thousand years after this was written, but but to a Jew this was an encouraging word. This was an, an encouraging thing to a Jew. See, to a Jew, there were two great crops, the spring crop and the autumn crop. 
And that, that, that spring crop was, was basically a crop full of um, the fruits of the land, the, the grapes, the, the fruits. And they would take those fruits and they would make wine. And so the, him saying that the goblet would never lack the choices of wines, basically he's saying that is this, you are a blessing to me. And that harvest in the, in, in the autumn was a harvest of wheat. And if that wheat would grow and it'd be plentiful, if there would be a mound of wheat, basically it was God's blessing upon the land because he sent the latter rains and there was a great harvest. This man is looking at his wife and he's saying, honey, we have all the wine we need. You, you, you are like, you are a blessing from God in my life. You are God's blessing to me. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you looked at your spouse in the eye and said, you know what, honey? You are God's blessing to me. You are God's blessing to me. I mean, God has blessed me with a good job. God has blessed me with some wonderful kids. But listen, they fail to, they don't compare to the blessing I have in you. You are God's blessing in my life. Proverbs 19, 14 says, Houses and lands are from fathers, but a good wife is a gift from God. She is your blessing. Do you say those things to her? Do you tell her how much of a blessing you are to me? How much of a gift from God that you are to me? This man does. He says, Your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle. Remember this? Yeah, I know it's kind of spicy, isn't it, Chuck? This guy just tells it like it is. And this is years and years after the honeymoon. But he says the same thing, doesn't he? And remember a few weeks ago, we talked about the honeymoon and how these gazelles were, were, were just little deer. And you don't spook deer, right? You treat them tenderness. It's a picture of tenderness. It's a picture of tenderness. And you know what I hear oftentimes in counseling sessions? And women will, if they're honest, they would tell you. That when we were first married, when we were in the honeymoon stage, you know, the relationship sexually was, was very tender. There was a lot of cuddling. There was a, a lot of romance. But now, after 20 years, he's lost his tenderness. It's just a physical act, and then it's over. Can I tell you something? Not this man. After all of these years, there's still tenderness. Now, you might not have heard an amen but every woman, I promise you, just said amen in their own heart. He goes on, your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are the pools of Heshbon by the gate of the bath of Rabim. Your nose is like the tower of Lebanon looking towards Damascus. Now this is a picture. He's looking at his wife and her nose is like the tower. Okay, and basically what this is, in, in that time period, it was, a, it was a sign of defense. Okay, this tower was erected and they would look for their enemies to come in. And so this man is looking at his wife and he's saying, you know what? I find safety and security in your face. Women, does your husband feel safe around you? Or do you, do you speak words of, of discouragement to him? Do you speak with your friends? Do you gossip about him? Do you share your fights with other women in this church? Some women ask, why does my husband go to church? Why doesn't he want to come to church with me? Well, here's a big reason. Maybe he doesn't find safety and security in your face, all right? Maybe because the words that you speak, words of discouragement, you, you, you bring out all of his bad points that he doesn't want to come. In this church, we're not going to gossip about our husband, all right? You're not going to gossip. You're not going to whine and complain about all the things that your husband does wrong. Because I promise you, that's not going to bring you two together, and that's going to push him far away from the house of God. This woman, her, her face brought security and safety to this man's heart. He was, he, he was ready. There was tenderness. There was joy. They didn't think about the, the good things. They actually said them. They spoke words of life in their relationship. In fact, one of the most common and complimentary things we say as, as couples is this, I love you. I love you. Even if your relationship isn't that great, you still say, I love you. 
but I want to challenge you to take it to the next level. Don't just say, I love you. Insert the word, because. Because. I love you because you're a good husband. I love you because you work your fingers to the bone and you provide for us. I love you because you cook this awesome meal and it's wonderful. I love you because after all of these years, you are still attractive to me. After all these years, you are still sexy. You are still wonderful. I love you because. But here's the thing. Whenever you don't say something good, by human nature, your spouse usually assumes something bad. And we know this is true. How many of you have texted, texted somebody and, um, you know, maybe you were kind of joking a little bit. And maybe you said, hey, fat boy, what's up, homie, you know? And, and then they don't text back right away. And you start to get a little nervous. You think, man, they're mad, they're upset, they're not, they're not connecting with me, and so you have to type in joke as a text, because oftentimes, if we don't say something nice, we oftentimes assume something bad. It's important that we don't just think good thoughts about our spouse, that we actually say good things about our spouse. An encouraging word will go a long way. You know what I love about my wife? This is my wife, Tanya. Can we give her a hand? She puts up with me all the time. It, it, it truly is amazing. Uh, we have a, a wild relationship. It's so funny because I'm just always moving and she's just always trying to settle me down. Um, but you know what's amazing about my wife is there's safety and security uh, in her arms. I don't come home and I don't worry about her talking bad about me. In fact, when she gets on the phone and I'm in my office, I can hear her say something positive. Oh, my husband is so wonderful. He did the dishes. And you know what happens? No matter if I'm watching Sports Center or anything, I turn it down and begin to tiptoe. You know, because I want to hear all the good things she's saying about me. It's amazing how that kind of dynamic, that dynamic in your relationship can help you out. It can encourage you. Listen to what she says. She's talking now. It says this. I, I belong to my beloved Beloved, and his, listen to what this next phrase is, his desire is for me. His desire is for me. That Hebrew word is tashuka, and it means to consume. If you've ever watched the Nature Channel and you've seen a lion go after a, a gazelle or anything like that, it's, it's tashuka, to go after. So this man is, is, is pursuing his spouse. He's con wanting to consume her. He's wanting the intimacy level to go deep. And he's using his words to build up and not tear down. How do you use your words? Are they to build up? Are they encouraging to your spouse? Are they lifting up their, your spouse? See, we all go through stressful times. We all can get a little rigid and bitter and angry. And so often we take the stress of work and we bring it home. I've done that. I'm the first to admit, when things get stressful at church, I oftentimes take it home. It's important that we stop doing that. It's important that we use our words to speak life, not death, to our family. Number two, if you think something special, do it. If you think something special, do it. And I'm going to break this up into two different types. The first one is this. It's purposeful time. If you think about going and doing something together, don't just think about having that time. Make it happen. Make it a priority. This is what she says in verse 11. She says, come, my beloved, let's go to the countryside. Let's spend the night in the villages. So, so basically what she's doing is, is saying this, let's go to a bed and breakfast. Let's get away for a while and let's spend some time together. Let's reconnect. Can I encourage every married couple to do this? At least once a year, farm the kids off, take some time, take one, two, three, four days and spend some time together. You know the worst thing that you can do? is to build your relationship around your kids. Moms, this is going to be hard for you. This may convict you, but you don't build your relationship around your kids or on your kids because when you do that, when they graduate, you're going to be looking across the table to somebody you don't even know anymore. 
and there's a marital drift. Guys, this is what often happens with you. You try to build your relationship and your marriage on your career. It doesn't work. It falls short. And you will spend one day, you'll look around and say, who is this woman? I remember marrying her, but I don't know nothing about you now. When you build your relationship on your kids and on your career, it will fall short. You build your relationship first on Christ and then on each other. And when you do that, there will be love and joy in your relationship. So I I encourage you, I challenge you, take some time, spend some time together. I'm going to be honest with you. In ministry, it is chaotic. Life is busy. I have six kids. I I mean, it's stressful in my house. We are constantly going and going and going. And there are times where we have to. I never said we need to. I said we have to break away, farm the kids off, and get time together alone. All right? Pastor Jill, I don't know how I'm going to do that. I don't have the time, I don't have the money, I don't know how this is going to happen. Hear me, you don't have time not to do that. Listen, it is so important for you to do that you have to do it. It's, it's that vital to your relationship. It's that key. Well, I don't know where I'm gonna take my kids. Leave them in the car, I don't know. You gotta have time together. Because when you are together, it's amazing what happens. When me and Tanya, we're gonna go in, in, in March, We're going to spend some time together, and I promise you, we're going to be rolling on the floor, laughing and and, uh, other things, and it's going to be awesome. (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm I'm in trouble. Is it getting hot in here? It's getting hot in here. Listen to what she says, verse 12. She goes on, and she says, let us go early to the vineyards and see if the vines have budded. So they're basically going to the park. If there's blossoms, if the blo- their blossoms have opened, if their pomegranates are in blue. So what is she saying here next? This is so awesome. There I will give you my love. Woo! This woman is speaking words of life. She's encouraging. She's saying, we are going to the park and we are going to, this is going to be exciting. I don't want to get to PG-13, but we're going to the park and this is gonna be fun. We are gonna make love. There's gonna be intimacy. There's gonna be joy in the park. Now, I don't want to get calls from the jail this week. You guys are taking this too liberal. Some of you guys are gonna go to the park and this is before satellite, okay? This is before satellite imaging. This is before it was illegal, all right? So if some of you couples go to the park and try messing around, uh, I will visit you in jail, but I can't guarantee that it won't find itself in a sermon somewhere, all right? <laughs> so, so don't take this too liberal. Don't, don't do that, all right? But this is a man's dream come true, Ladies, in our culture, most women see their their man's sexual desire as a nuisance. It's the curse of our marriage. It's the only way we can have babies. If we could have any other way to have babies, I would have done it, but I had to have sex with him. That that, that is the, 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 the idea of our culture, not this woman. This woman is passionate about her husband. She doesn't see her husband's sex drive as a nuisance. She's encouraging her husband. She's saying yes to this. And you know what? That's important. Women, if you want your your husband to be insecure, if you want your husband to be looking down at the ground all the time, reject him. All right? It'll happen. It'll happen. If you want your husband to be full of joy and life, make this area that is so important to him special. Listen to what she says in, in, the, uh, in verse 13. All right, she says, The mandrakes send out their fragrance at our door in every delicacy. I went to the grocery store, she's saying, and I bought some mandrakes, both old and new, and I, that is, uh, excuse me, both old and new that I have, that I have stored up for you. See, it's not just about purposeful time. It's also about a thoughtful acts. She doesn't see her husband's sex drive as a nuisance. It's a blessing for her. And yet, her husband, remember her husband, pursued her, loved her, romanced her, used her, his words to speak life to her, and now she's responding in like, in serving her husband in this manner. Can you imagine how our relationships would be different if we tried to love one another like this? 
If the man was trying to romance his wife, if the man was speaking words of encouragement and love and grace to his wife, and the woman was open to respond to the love given, imagine how it would change our very lives. Guys, it's our words. And not just our words, it's our actions. It's doing the dishes. It's sweeping up the floor. It's helping take care of the kids. That's romance to my wife. She can care less about flowers and chocolates. If you do the dishes, oh, baby. You know? It's amazing how that works in a relationship. The third is this. Number three, if you want something different, be it. If you want something different, be it. You want something different in your relationship, don't demand your spouse to be different. You be different. You be a blessing to your spouse. Here's the truth. Here's the truth. You can't change somebody else. The only thing that you can change is who you are. I'm tired of couples coming into my office, pointing the finger at their spouse and letting them know, this is what you do wrong, this is what you do wrong, this is what you do. No, 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 no. You have to focus on the issues that you have brought into the relationship, the baggage that you have brought into the relationship. Allow Christ to change you. And it's amazing as Christ changes you, how that will bring about change in your spouse how that will bring about change in the relationship. If you remember early on, she said, we're not gonna be like everybody else. She says, I'm not going to be like the veiled women who give themselves to other men. I'm going to be different. Last week, we talked about conflict, and we saw this couple. They made the choice, I'm not gonna be like everybody else. I'm not gonna do conflict resolution like everybody else. We're gonna do it God's way. Do you want your relationship to be good? Do you want your marriage to thrive? Do you want your life to be full of joy? Remember this. It's not all about your your spouse's issues. Do they have issues? Absolutely. It's about identifying your own issues and getting rid of those first and allowing Christ to minister to your needs so that you can serve and love your spouse better. And I'm going to put a lot of focus on the men in here. Because men, you are the head of your house. You are to be the leader in your home, the spiritual leader in your house. Women are the multipliers. Women multiply. If I go to the grocery store, I'll buy some food, and she will multiply it into a great room, a great meal, all right? If, if I give her my love, she will multiply it and give me a bunch of kids, all right? Because that's what women do. They, give, they multiply things. If you give her a hard time, if you give her words that put her down, she will multiply it and make your life a living heck. All right, I'm not going to say it. Some of you guys are just waiting. Ooh, Pastor Joe. But they will multiply it. They will multiply that in your relationship. Your marriage can be as good as both of you want it to be. I want to finish up with one last scripture. All right? One last scripture that really seals this whole series off. And it's a powerful picture of what happens when a man serves God and a woman serves God and they come together and out of that love for God serve each other. It's amazing what happens in their relationship. Listen to what uh, Song of Solomon says, chapter 8, verse 6. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. It's jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Place me like a seal over your heart. You know what he's saying? I am yours and you are mine. He's loving his spouse. Now, I'm gonna close like this. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with my beautiful bride, Tanya. And um, she's going to be embarrassed right now, but I don't get a lot of time to, to spend in service with her because oftentimes she's upstairs in the kids' church. But I want to just say, uh, Tanya, uh, it is just awesome to serve Jesus with you, and I love you with all of my heart. I know there are obstacles that come along. There are stresses in our relationship. But with Christ, we're going to do this together, okay? I love you. Now, I did that for me because, honestly, I want brownie points for, for later. But, <laughs> but, 
But listen, listen, guys. Let's have relationships that honor Christ. You know, you know what I've seen in this area? In this area? I'm just going to be real honest. I've seen a lot of so-called Christians that they can tell you the Hebrew meaning and the Greek meaning and they can talk about Jesus, but then you look at their relationship and it's falling apart. That's not God-honoring. Can we have marriages that are strong? Can, can we love each other in this church? Can we love our spouses? Can you, can you imagine how that would just change our culture? Let's be the type of church that doesn't just talk about it, that just doesn't know all the principles, but actually puts it into practice. And I'm going to work on my marriage, you work on your marriage, and let's be a, a church that is focused on the family and the relationships that matter most. Amen? Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. I want to pray for you. And I want to challenge you to be different in this culture. To be different in this culture. So Father, I just pray for marriages. Marriages in this place that seem to be hanging by a thread. God, they, they just don't know what to do. Lord, Lord, we've been through many principles. We've talked about fighting. We've talked about dating. We've talked about sexuality. But Father, we know we can't do this in our own strength, in our own power, with our own strength. God, we are doomed. We lean upon you. We, we need your grace and your spirit in our life to do anything good. So Father, fill us with your love Fill us with your grace. Help us to be authentic people of God in this day, in Christ's name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Now listen to me, all right? We're going to be starting uh, next week a series called Not a Fan. And this is going to be a challenging series that I'm going to challenge you guys not to be just fans of Jesus, to be real followers of Jesus Christ. So make sure you come on out. I'd encourage you to come to the first service. It's going to be a great time in Christ.